organization's actions may motivate organizations, support persons to engage in uh, perception management of the organization as a whole. It's important to note that uh, for any given organization, all three kinds of perceptions exist simultaneously. Organizations' images and reputations, uh, as well as identities, may be compared uh, and contrasted uh, along four dimensions. Their primary perceivers, their defining categorizations, their typical entrance, and their specificity. ASBA describe all of these uh, and how organizations' images, reputations, and identities are defined by these four dimensions. Organizational images uh, are relatively current and temporary perceptions of an organization held by internal or external audiences regarding an organization's fit with particular distinctiveness categories. These distinctiveness are organizational legitimacy, organizational correctness and consistency, and organizational trustworthiness. So, uh, organizational images are relatively short-lived, specific perceptions of an organization, and that organizations uh, may possess several distinct images at the same time. These attributes distinguish organizational images from organizational identities and reputations, as they tend to be more enduring. Identities are perceived solely by internal audiences and reputations by external audiences. Also, organizational images may be perceived by both internal and external audiences. That's the difference about, uh, among them. The most common organizational images are as follows. Organizational legitimacy uh, is the most commonly studied organizational image. It may be defined as a generalized perception or assumption that the actions of an entity are desirable, proper, or appropriate within some socially constructed system or norms, values, beliefs, and uh, definitions. Legitimate organization, what is the uh, pros uh, of legitimacy to organizations? Firstly, legitimate organizations and their leaders are perceived as more worthy, more meaningful, more predictable, and more trustworthy than illegitimate organizations. As a result, organizations perceived as legitimate are likely to receive unquestioned support and resources from constituents especially in times of crisis. Legitimate organizations are also more likely to gain the commitment, attachment, and identification by members. The opinions of valued spoke, uh, stakeholders can influence uh, an organization's performance and survival. Who are these valued st stakeholders? These are employees valued uh, these, uh, stakeholders. These are employees, customers, favorable media representatives, industry analysts, uh, and uh, some concerned public students, citizens. Another good example is the fact that corporate legitimacy allows uh, companies to command and premium prices from loyal customers and gain support from industry experts and analysts without excessive advertising or promotional expenditures expenditures. The value of legitimacy for organization and their spokespersons appears to be most evident in times of crisis or controversy when legitimacy is challenged or threatened. When organizational legitimacy is called into question, public support and media's, uh, media's uh, positive uh, portrayal of the organization may diminish. That's very important. Uh, organizational correctness and consistency is the second form of organizational form of organizational image. The behaviors of top managers, uh, such as decision making regarding ongoing organizational projects, affect images of the organization effect, uh, as a whole. Uh, consistency consistency uh, in top managers' decisions over time may lead audiences uh, to view 
to organize the organization as a whole as more stable as well as more correct in its past actions. And as for the organization of trustworthiness, this is the third type of organizational image, as, uh, as I said earlier. The image of organizational trustworthiness is the perception that an organization displays competence, benevolence, and integrity in its behaviors or beliefs. At this point, competence refers to the abilities and skills that allow an organization to achieve desired goals. Benevolence refers to an organization's apparent willingness to do good, and integrity refers to an organization adher adherence to principles or ideals that conform to social norms. If an organization is viewed as having a culture and set of control systems uh, that limit its actions through values, uh, standards or and behavior principles, then this organization will be perceived as having an image of trustworthiness. In both cases of insider and outsider perceptions, organizational trustworthiness appears to be dependent on the pres presence uh, of uh, industry or organizational structures and uh, as well as procedures that delimit organizational action. And uh, what about the organizational reputations? Uh, organizational reputations differ from organizational images in several ways. Be, it, uh, be careful about it. Reputations are more general than are uh, images. Image reflects a set of specific associations, whereas reputation denotes all an overall judgment regarding the extent to which a firm is held in high esteem or regard. Uh, secondly, organizational reputations have been defined in external audiences and during perceptions and how a firm's products, job, uh, strategies and prospects compare to those of competing firms. The thir thirdly, images are defined primarily by distinctiveness categorizations while reputations are defined by status categorizations, such as best small school or most admired large company. Reputations is both uh, perceived and legitimate, legitimated by external audiences versus internal audiences. Accordingly, uh, organizational reputations involve enduring status categorizations of an organization which is relative to other organizations, as perceived by external audiences and stakeholders. Uh, when we continue uh, on organizational reputations, stability or consistency in behavior and performance is important in reputation building uh, performance because it helps increase audiences uh, confidence that they can predict future performance based on the past one. Many firms in the automotive industry, for example, build reputations for performance for repeatedly publicizing their early successes in automobile context. Positive distinctiveness is important to reputations uh, building because it helps audiences to categorize individual organizations on status relevant traits. When a company became associated with new management techniques, it gained a reputation of being more innovative than peer organizations that did not adopt these techniques. These are two perspectives on the, on the uh, use and management of organization reputations. One of them is resource-based based views. They focus on the capabilities, attributes, and resources of a firm that are distinctive, rare, durable, and generally imitable, inimitable. The second one is market-based views. Uh, they focus on reputations as strategic uh, attributes that firms uh, use to gain a competitive advantage in, in complete information settings. 
And what about organizational identities? Uh, these identities are the answers to organizational members' questions, who we are. That's important. Defining the organization, identities may be relatively complex and it includes status, that is, we are top tier, distinctiveness, that is, we are creative, such a categorization. Uh, it is also specific which means we are the most family-friendly company. And general, we are one of the most admired companies in Europe. Similar to organizations' reputations, organizational identities are commonly perceived uh, as being enduring. Yet, they are not in, 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 uh, immutable, and identity management can success, success, successfully change an organization's identity. Organizations' identities may be conceptualized as insiders' relatively enduring perceptions of their organization's fit with distinctiveness, categorizations, and status categorizations along general and specific dimensions. Let me drink some water. And let's continue with the organizational identities. Individual members who identify with uh, their organization uh, are likely to perceive that their own identities are th threatened by events that threaten the organization's identity, which is very interesting. Organizational identity management may be motivated as much, of, uh, as much by members desires to maintain positive perceptions of their own individual identities as by desires to maintain positive perceptions of their organization's identity. Further, complicating the management of organizational identities is the fact that organizations may be defined by more than one identity. Uh, for example, a business school may have a teaching identity and uh, a research identity at the same time. These multiple identities may appear to be in conflict with one another. That is, organizations may have hybrid identities that are composed of two or more identities that will not normally be expected to go together. Also, these multiple identities may define distinct yet compatible aspects of the organization. For example, a university that prides itself on both excellent teaching and research, uh, as, I, uh, as an earlier uh, example. In these cases, the dual uh, identities may support each other. For example, research informs teaching, and teaching provides a context for research. So uh, sometimes it's very useful uh, to use the dual identities uh, for organizations. and. When it comes to symbolic actions, these are the second component of the uh, organizational uh, perception management. Symbolic actions include any activities by our organizational spokespersons, at least in part, to affect audience perceptions of the organization. Such ex actions may be primarily symbolic. Uh, for example, changing the name Kentucky Fried Chicken to KFC. Uh, it's intended to uh, minimize unhealthy images uh, associated with the word fried without changing the menu. Or it may be primarily practical, for example, adopting without fanfare or publicity a total quality management program based on a desire to uh, improve product quality. Or it may be somewhere in uh, between, between a primarily symbolic or primarily practical. There are four specific types of symbolic actions used to manage organizational perceptions. These are verbal accounts, justifications for corporate downsizing included in an annual report, for example. Uh, and second, distinctiveness and status-oriented categorizations and comparisons uh, of organizations. Uh, for example, defining a business school as top tier in promotional materials. Uh, or the third one, uh, this may be uh, symbolic behaviors. 
for example, contribution to charitable foundation and causes. And the fourth one is the display of, uh, of physical markers, markers such as uh, flags hung in retail stores uh, in the United States following the September 11th uh, terrorist att uh, attacks. Verbal accounts may be defined as as follows. Uh, explanation, these are explanations that are designed to influence perception of an organization's responsibility for an event or for the valence of an event, whether it is positive or negative. Verbal accounts are used primarily to manage external uh, organizational images and reputations. These are versus internal identities. There are three primary features of accounts. These are form, content and communication medium. These all uh, are influencers of the verbal accounts. Uh, what is the account form? Uh, a number of account forms commonly follow negatively perceived events. Uh, these are excuses, are accounts that are designed to minimize perceptions of responsibility for a negative event. Uh, for example, when we say it wasn't our fault, it's an excuse. Justifications are accounts that are designed to minimize uh, the perceived negativity of an event, especially when responsibility is not in question. When we say uh, after a negative event, it wasn't as bad as you think, or we had a good reason for doing it, it's a justification. Denials are accounts that attempt to refute any responsibility for an event. If we say we didn't do it, it's a denial. Or uh, these denials claim that an event was not, uh, was not at all negative. It didn't happen. When we say it didn't happen, uh, it's a denial also. Apo apologies are accounts that accept full responsibility uh, for a negative event, but claim regret. We did it, but we're sorry. When we say it, it's a typical apology. Other accounts uh, are accounts that... Uh, designed to follow positively uh, events for an organization. These are entitlings. Are, uh, these are accounts that are designed to increase perceptions of responsibility for a positive event. When we say we did it or we were more responsible than you think, it's a entitlings. And the other one is enhancements. Uh, these are accounts designed to increase the perceived positiveness of an event when responsibility is admitted. For example, it was positive, or when we say it was better than you think, it's an enhancement. The accounts that organizational spokesperson use following negative events is either accommodative or defensive, and those that follow positive events are acclaims. And excuses and denials may be combined in defensive accounts, while justification and uh, enhancement may be combined in accommodative accounts. These are also included in the uh, in the last week uh, in the uh, reading material uh, strategic planning for PR by Smith. Uh, you must have uh, remembered. Excuses and denials may be combined in defensive accounts, as I say, while justification and enhancement may be combined in accommodative accounts. In an example, spokespersons of California cattle industry uh, often combine justifications and enhancement in accommodative accounts that gave in response to public concerns about the potentially harm harmful effects of treating beef cattle uh, with hormones. Company spokespersons justified the use of hormones, arguing that the drugs help to keep cattle healthy. And they added that the reduction in costs achieved by producing large beef cattle was passed on to, on to consumers as reduced prices. These are the mixed use of uh, the account forms. 
And the other one of the verbal accounts, the other components of the uh, verbal accounts, is the account content. The content of accounts includes the arguments, evidence, and illustrations that back up the basic account form. In general, accounts are seen uh, as more adequate to the extent that they are detailed, based on sound reasoning and sensitive. Adequate accounts often contain references to social and industry norms as a means of indicating sound reasoning and sensitivity to audience needs. For example, spokespersons from radical social movement organizations often use references to normative and widely endorsed procedures. Account, uh, accounts used by spokespersons for mental health institutions, for example, uh, intended to manage uh, organizational perceptions uh, of legitimacy often uh, refer to new, widely endorsed organizational goals, for example, abolition versus custodial care, and organizational structures also, uh, for example, team uh, approaches, formal policies, and uh, unitizations. For example, police officers in the New York City Port Authority uh, bus terminal removed homeless persons from the terminal. They backed up their justifications for doing so by noting that they were enforcing an anti-loitering law, a normative procedure. They, they referred to a normative procedure. Later, the Port Authority spokespersons backed up their enhancement uh, of their organization's image by highlighting their use of new socially endorsed, uh, endorsed structures. These included a paid consultant and the human resource administration to provide sensitivity training for police. So as you see, uh, references to social norms are contained in a legitimating label of the organization. For example, when Chrysler was charged with committing fraud by selling used vehicles, as new. In this case, the vehicles had been driven by Chrysler executives with the odometers disconnected prior to sale. CEO Lee, uh, the famous CEO of uh, Chrysler, uh, which is Lee Ayokoka, uh, attempted to manage Chrysler's reputation for trustworthiness by denying that the company had done anything wrong and labeling the actions uh, in question as a test program rather than a fraudulent executive perk. And what about the content and medium? A second type of content used to bolster accounts is ideological imagery or illustration. For example, in the case of Apollo uh, space mission failure, NASA spokesperson used the frontier narrative and imagery to portray the uh, space agency in a positive light in enhancement uh, following the mission's failure. At the press conference, uh, NASA uh, administrators characterized the mission as an epic struggle in which the astronauts were pitted against the hostile environment of space. These spokespersons also described the astronauts who dared to brave the perils of space as possessing bravery, skill, discipline, courage, ingenuity, resourcefulness, and teamwork. Accounts communications medium, finally, uh, it's important to keep in mind that there are many mediums through which verbal accounts uh, may be communicated. These may be paid advertisements by organizations, uh, company newsletters, an example of it, uh, you can see it on the screen. Uh, annual reports, as you see, websites or emails, or uh, social media accounts, and so on. These are all uh, the medium uh, in which the content and account content flow for an, orga for an organization. And the second verbal strategy for managing perceptions of organizations is to offer organizational categorizations and comparisons. In particular, organizations wishing to affirm these are the identities use categorizations and comparisons to define who they are and who they are not. Uh, in social psychology, it has been shown that on dimensions that are self-relevant, 
uh, that is one stand on ideological issues such as gun control. Individuals prefer to see themselves as relatively unique compared to others because similarity to many others on self-defining dimensions may imply that one is this in, in, in distinct, undistinguished or mediocre. This is the inclusion in social categories. As a result, individuals may affirm they, uh, their distinctive identities by categorization, uh, categorizing themselves in ways that display these unique attributes. Also, individuals often prefer uh, social categorizations that emphasize comparisons to inferior social groups as a means of uh, affirming or enhancing their self-concept. Recently, organizational researchers, researchers have found that members and spokespersons for an organization may perceive these same types of identity threats when the organization to which they belong is categorized in ways that run counter to their perceptions of its identity. Organizations may choose to manage multiple organizational identities by compartmentalization. Uh, for example, keep, keeping the identities separate by maintaining multiple identity categorizations. Uh, by integration, fusing the identities through a single new categorization. Deletion, another one, uh, another way uh, that organizations may choose to manage multiple organizational identities, uh, it's delicious, deletion, Re, uh, that is removing some identity categorizations, or aggregation, that is creating a hi hi uh, hierarchy or identity categorizations. What about the exclusion from social category? Uh, in addition to categorizations to which on, an organization belongs, managers identify categorizations to which the organization does not belong. So, organizational identity management may underscore an organization's disidentification dis from specific negatively viewed categorization. For example, organizations that are proactively changing their identity due to a man manager uh, or acquisition or management directive may want members to give up old identifications so that they can more readily embrace new ones. Symbolic behaviors <coughs> involve both routine and special actions that are used uh, to indicate something about an organization's image or identity. Symbolic, symbolic organizations' behaviors are most commonly used as perception management tools. When, uh, for example, when they are perceived to be visible or salient, uh, for example, the use of displays in supermarkets, or when they affect a the salient aspect of the organization's image or identity. Uh, that is introducing a new product or service related to an organization's central mission, such as online education by a renowned university, for example. Such behaviors are effective perception management tactics because they literally show the organization's leaving its image, identity, or reputation. For example, early automotive manufacturers uh, at the turn of the 20th century, uh, use speed or uh, angry uh, context to display specific feature of their, uh, their cars, uh, such as uh, a good example uh, to this is Formula One races. A symbol, as a symbol of behavior, Formula One is a very effective uh, tool uh, for uh, automobile uh, companies. Uh, to maximize their impact, symbolic behaviors are often coupled with verbal accounts or communication that explain them. Automotive manufacturers use newspaper advertisements to publicize uh, their contest wins and increase public awareness. Four primary forms of symbolic behaviors are used to manage perception and organization. These are behaviors related to primary business activities. 
treatment or employees or prospective employees. Uh, thirdly, visible affiliation, affiliation with groups, or organizations, and es escalation behaviors. Behaviors related to primary business actions, it is the most common forms of symbolic behavior used as the organizational perception management uh, involve visible actions, attacking competitors, for example, recalling uh, products. These are related to primary business activities. Typically, this means signaling uh, organizational uh, reputations or images through activities related to putting out products or services. Uh, maybe we can give two examples. Organizations may attempt to signal a reputation of toughness by expressing enduring performances losses uh, to deter other firms from entering their market. Uh, another example may be the fact that firms may attempt to signal a reputation for high quality by lavish expenditures or uh, advertising. Uh, treatment of employees, what about it? Uh, symbolic behavior uh, related to the treatment of uh, employees can also be used and to enhance and affirm an organization's identity. Firms that engaged in employment practices that promoted family life signaled uh, an identity categorization of family-friendly company or were recognized by Working Mother uh, magazine. These practices are good advan uh, advancement uh, opportunities for women available on-site childcare, leave for childbirth, uh, job sharing, flex time and work at home options. These are very simple. And what about the affiliation with other groups or organizations? In some cases, affiliation behaviors and their advertisements can be used to manage an organization's identity. Visible affiliations with a high status or distinctive organization, uh, for example, advertising a firm's recent inclusion in Fortune's magazine's most admired uh, list, can enhance an organization's identity by creating the perception that the organization is in the same uh, league as other perennially uh, admired companies. And what about the escalation behaviors? In situations in, in which es escalation behaviors occurs, the decision makers continue to in invest resources uh, toward their original stated goals as a symbolic means of self-justification. Further, such actions demonstrate consistency in uh, behavior over time. Physical markers, this can be seen easily on the screen. Physical markers commonly include size, styles, and location of office buildings, investment banks located on or off Wall Street, for example. The sign of Hollywood in Los Angeles, the uh, office of uh, Google, this very famous one. Type of furnishings. This is a typical example of physical markers. Decker, the, pre the presence or absence of, of artwork and leaf plants, as well as company logos, signs, and letterheads. These are all physical markers, and uh, these uh, influence directly the uh, organizational perception management. These are used effectively. Finley. Uh, and organizational spokespersons is a third component of the organizational perception management. Uh, these spokespersons convey or explain symbolic actions, which is verbal accounts, as you see, uh, as you seen earlier. Symbolic behaviors, display of physical markers, etc. To organizational audiences, spokespersons include anyone who is perceived by audience members as representing the organization. The CEOs are very influential uh, spokespersons of uh, organizations, uh, locally and globally. Empirical organizational research reveals that the most common types of organizational spokespersons are organizational leaders, public relations professionals, and employees. These are, the, this is an empirical uh, research in the US. These are not this, uh, these are, uh, this is not the case in Turkey. 
for example. For several reasons, especially in the US, visible organizational leaders or official public uh, relations professionals are the most common types of spokespersons who carry out the organizational perception management. They are typically the ones who offer initial accounts following both positive and negative uh, events. For example, in annual reports, the letters uh, to shareholders explaining past performance of the organization is signed, simply signed by the company leader. This is a, this is a very typical uh, example of the um, uh, leaderships. Uh, what about the employees? For events on a smaller and less controversial scale, symbolic actions intended to manage day-to-day -day perceptions or to provide anticipatory perception management. Uh, these are often conducted by rank and file uh, employees. These employees routinely interact with the customers and or the public directly and indirectly and thus uh, are often they are often in a position to provide symbolic information about an organization the employees as a group are symb symbolically defined as the spokespersons in the uh, organization perception management most commonly this occurs when the organization is dominated by an employee union or unions that speak on behalf of the rank and file employees and uh, the last components of the uh, organizational perception management the, are organizational audiences. Organizational audiences include all the parties who are targets of the organizational perception management. Audiences may be made up, uh, may be made up of audiences external to the organizations, which are members of other organizations, public interest groups, and the general publics. And this may be uh, external to the organization also, uh, which are employees, stockholders, uh, volunteers, students, and dues-paying members, for example. The general public is the most uh, common external audience uh, studied by researchers of the OPM. It's often the largest group affected by organizational events that threaten short-term organizational images. External audiences include consumer or potential consumers who hear about faculty, uh, fa uh, faulty products or uh, services. Uh, this may be uh, students, students of communities harmed by environmental pollution, for example, or citizens or in communities affected by corporate layoffs. Internal audiences uh, is uh, aimed by the organizational perception uh, as they receive much less attention than that aimed at external uh, audiences. Specifically, uh, organizational identities are important to internal audiences and identity management becomes necessary when internal audiences perceive that organization status or distinctiveness is threatened or that its identity is internally conflicted. So, uh, that's all about the organizational perception managers, and we uh, switch to the neuroscience and neuromarketing, the second uh, session of the webinar. If you have questions, I'm happy to answer them. So now it's time to go over the neuroscience and neuromarketing uh, conceptions and terminology. During, a, uh, during this part of this uh, during a part of this process, we, we, we will follow the Eric Duplessis terminology. And then we will go over the concepts and processes of neuromarketing. Uh, this part of the webinar uh, is also uh, as an introductory nature. Uh, as for uh, the details of the topic, you will find them in the reading and visual materials placed under the week two on LMS. Please read and watch them. According to uh, Duplessis, uh, the difference between humankind and the other animals on the planet is that we live in a world that we have changed over many millennia to suit our needs. We did this by our ability to plan for the future and create. We learned that uh, uh, to herd cattle means we do not need to hunt. 
and by cultivating food, we do not need to forage. For example, we learn to trade and we learn to specialize. We learn to make tools uh, with which to hunt, herd or cultivate food. We even learned that some people produce better quality food than others and we, we prefer to buy their produce production. In reality, what is happening is the, that we are planning our future based on our knowledge that we will at some stage and feel hungry. We are preempting our feeling of hunger by planning. And we also know uh, at some stage we feel uh, we will feel bored and so we plan for this by buying a computer game. This uh, presupp presupposes to uh, presupposes that we have bought a computer. We know that we will at some stage feel a need to relax, so we buy a CD and so on. This process will go so on. And this process describes uh, described very uh, simplistically here underlines a lot of marketing and advertising theories. The Persian roster, roster grid, for example, is based on this. The problem solution advertising style is based on this also. There are uh, philosophical viewpoints that argue against the above description of behavior as not explaining all behaviors. The question raised involves issues like deferred uh, gratification, sympathy, and some obvious questionable behaviors like setting yourself alight with petrol in protest at some government action, uh, for example. The issue about sympathy is being solved by neuroscientists, having found what appears to be the sympathy neuron. It is a great benefit for the survival of a society or a tribe. If evaluation, which is uh, which is happening if evaluation has blessed the members with a sympathy neuron. In all cases, the decision to do what we might consider to be deviant, abnormal behavior is explained simply by the person who indulges uh, in it, having a greater expectation of feeling good by these behaviors. From a marketing perspective, the analogy will be saving money or insurance products. It is the expectations that create a better feeling of good than uh, the immediate consumption of the money. And what is the marketing practice at this point? Do places argue that people plan to satisfy their future needs by buying things now? Or sometimes that, buy, that they buy things on impulse for immediate consumption. Even for an impulse purchase that we consume immediately, the, the, act of, the act of consumption is after the act of purchasing, that is in the future. Ultimately, they buy brands because they believe the brands will make them feel better now or in the future. Interestingly, even if they just expect that the brands will make them feel better in the future, Buying them now makes people feel better now. The brand choice decision that they make now is based on the interpretations that reach their frontal lobes. These interpretations are not only the interpretation of their current environment, but also the interpretations of these thoughts. In other words, there seem to be uh, an as-if circuit that allows the brain to evaluate how they would feel if they did something. This might sound confusing. This interpretation of the brand that includes how one feels about the brand, duplexes calls the brand soma, based on the Antonio Damasio's term soma. It, this term describes the feeling component of the interpretation of things that we see, hear or smell. A mark a marketing professional's objective is to influence this brand soma. The brand soma is based on memories or knowledge or experience and neurologically simply uh, simpli simplify uh, the chemical state of the synapses between neurons. As a conclusion, the, the task of the marketing professional 
is to ensure that the brand soma is positive, at least more positive than that of the competing brands. Um, what about neuromarketing? marketing? At this point, uh, let's have a look at what the neuromarketing is and offer. Neuromarketing is the field that claims to apply the principles of neuroscience, which is the scientific study of the nervous system, to marketing research by studying sensor, sen, uh, sensory uh, uh, motor of consumers cognitive and effective response to marketing stimuli. Combining marketing psychology and neuroscience, the concept of neuromarketing has established valuable theoretical insights. Marketing focuses on constructing positive and unforgettable uh, experiences in consumers' minds. It is neuroscience that measures these impacts. Neuromarketing can be defined as a sort of marketing designed on the foundation of neuroscience. It is the most recent mechanical method utilized to understand consumers. Researchers in this field use technologies uh, such as functional magnetic resonance uh, imaging. Uh, this is intended to measure uh, changes in activity in parts of the brain. Uh, another uh, technology that researchers uh, in this field use, electroencephalography. Uh, the third one, steady state topography. And uh, the other one, magnet, magnetoencephalography. These technologies are intended to measure activity in specific regional spectra of the brain response. Sensors to measure changes in one's uh, psychological state, uh, also known as bi biometrics, which are heart rate, respir respiratory rate, and galvanic skin response. And the third one uh, that these technologies are intended to measure, facial coding to categorize to physical expression of emotion, or eye tracking to identify focal attention. These all are in order to learn why consumers make the decisions they do and which brain areas are responsible in this decision. Some organizations invested in their own laboratories, pers personnel or partnership with academia. To the marketing, mar uh, Neuromarketing Science and Business Association today centralizes academic publications or certifications and serves as a networking platform uh, in this area. Uh, it serves nearly uh, 107,000, uh, 1,700 1, uh, members in more than uh, 90 countries. Companies such as Google, uh, CBS, Frito-Lay, and uh, A&E Television are neuromarketing research services, use uh, neuromarketing research services to measure consumer reactions to their advertisements or products. In 2006, uh, Dr. Carl Marchi founded uh, Innerscope Research, which was acquired by Nielsen in May uh, 2015, and renamed Nielsen uh, Consumer Neuroscience. And Unilever is also very active in this field. Uh, Unilever's uh, Consumer Research uh, Exploratory uh, Fund had been publishing white papers on the potential applications uh, of neuromarketing. Theories behind neuromarketing were first explored by Gerald Zaltman. Zaltman and his associates were employed by organizations such as Coca-Cola to in, in, uh, instigate uh, brain, scan, brain scans and observe neural activity.
Is there a problem here, then? What happened? Maybe Alexander will help us to fix it. Is it okay? Yes, do you do you see the for the sixth slide? What does neuromarketing comes from? Okay. Let's continue then. Uh, marketing is a uh, reasonably new field of discovery. Theories behind neuromarketing were first explored by Gerald Zaltman. Zaltman and his associates uh, were employed by organizations. Junior, can, can you see the uh, actual slide? I see, you see slide six? How can we fix it, Alexander? Uh, hello, Fatih. Yes. Uh, you can change the slides uh, by uh, by the control that is uh, on the bottom of the, sc of the screen. On the bottom of the screen, there's a slide 46 out of 53. Can you see that? Yes. Yeah, you can change left, right. Yes, yes, I can change it. Yeah, we'll change whatever you need. Yeah. Okay. What's the problem then? I don't know. I see. Uh, I see slide forty-six now. Uh, at the uh, above, uh, at the top of the uh, screen, uh, these are two uh, options: return to presenter's view, and the other one, take over as presenter. Take over as a May presenter. May I click one of click, these? Click on a take over as a presenter. Is it okay? Everybody, can everybody see the 40? Yeah, now it's okay. 40, 46 slides? Okay. So, psychoanalysis, may, may I continue? Is it okay? Okay. Psychoanalysis, psychoanalysis techniques such as fMRYI and other neuro uh, technologies are used to discover an individual's underlying emotions and social interactions as represented in the scans. Best known technology of uh, neuromarketing was developed. Okay. Was developed in the late uh, 1990s by Gerald Zaltman. Uh, it, it was patented under the name of Zaltman Metaphor Illustration Technique, ZMET. And the term neuromarketing was only introduced in uh, 2002, published in an article by Brighthouse, Brighthouse, a marketing firm based in Atlanta. Brighthouse House sponsored neuropsychological research into uh, marketing divisions. Uh, they constructed a business unit that used fMR eye scans for market research purposes. Nothing can be seen. Yes. I can't see I can't see my presentation either. Uh, Are you comfortable with the okay. webinar? Yes. There's uh, on the bottom of the screen. There's uh, right to the next uh, to the uh, red button. Yes. Share content with an arrow. Yeah. So uh, you can present PowerPoint file again. Upload it and it will be okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. 
May I click on the rename and attach? Yes, yes you can. Okay. Can you see the slides right now? Yes, everybody can see the slide now. No, it's okay. Okay. Yes, we're back on the road again. Are you comfortable with the webinar? Is everybody good? Everybody good? Thank you, Alexander. Human brains uh, process over 90% of information non-consciously. Uh, conventional market research, such as focus groups or surveys, are typically uh, used to understand behavior and decision making. However, these research methods do not research the non-conscious non -conscious thinking of consumers. This result in and incompatibility between incompatibility between market research findings and the actual behavior exhibited uh, by the market uh, by the target market at the point of purchase neuromarketing rather focuses on the mri and eeg scans which produce brain electrical activity as well as blood flow market researchers use this information uh, to determine if uh, products or advertisements stimulate responses in the brain linked with positive emotions. And neuromarketing, the concept of neuromarketing was therefore introduced to study relevant human emotions and behavioral patterns uh, associated with new products, ads, uh, and decision making. Consumer behavior, behavior can now be investigated at both and individual conscious choices and underlying brain activity le levels. Neuromarketing displays a true uh, representation of reality superior to any traditional methods of research as it explores non-conscious information that will otherwise be unobtainable. The neural process obtained provide more accurate uh, predictions of uh, population level data in comparison to self-reported data. Marketing professionals can gain, at this point, insight into consumers' intentions. These tools may be administered Can everybody see it? You know, maybe uh, this is the sole problem with you, huh? Okay. May I continue, Gilnur? Seeing me, seeing me uh, will suffice, I think. <laughs> yes, may I continue? May I continue? Okay. Uh, professional, marketing professionals can gain insight into consumers' intentions. All these tools can be administered to gain understanding on intention and emotions towards branding and market strategies before application to target consumers. Neuroscience, uh, in other words, collecting information uh, on how the target market will respond to the future products is the first step involved for organizations producing a new product. Traditional methods of this research include focus groups or sizable surveys used to eval evaluate features of the proposed program. Product. This method of research uh, fails to gain a deep understanding of the consumer's non-conscious thoughts and emotions. Neuroscience has played an important role in improving behavioral uh, predictions and advancing the understanding of consumers. It also allows insight into neural differences seen in individuals when no behavioral differences are observed. For example, one consu consumer 
one customer may retrieve many memories when making a choice, whereas another customer may not retrieve uh, any memories. This insight allows marketing professionals to understand the consumer's brain activity and cognitive processes at a non-conscious level. They can then advertise the product so that it communicates and meet the needs of potential consumers with different predictions or choices. Now, that's all for neural marketing process also. Now, uh, we can pass to assignment two. Everybody uh, was waiting uh, to hear uh, uh, from me about the assignment two also. Am I right? Now let's see uh, again the assignment for this week. Uh, before this, uh, I hope that you are well connected to each other as teams. Are you? Is there anybody uh, who cannot or could not connect to uh, his or her uh, teammates? It's very important for you to be together in teams uh, because from now on uh, till the end of the course you will work uh, in teams and uh, that is to say the teams will remain the same during the uh, whole course so get together as soon as possible in your team this is, is this the only you uh, who can uh, uh, reach uh, your teammates we are two you and, and the other, Elif. Which team are you? Yes, team discussions is always working. Uh, get together as soon as as, uh, as soon as possible uh, and work together uh, start to, to work together uh, beginning uh, tomorrow's morning uh, I send Yes, you're better. You're in a better co condition, Maida. Maybe uh, you you can maybe get your team members mail mails. I will ask to uh, Dayan, the director of the program, if it's possible or not. Yes, I understand. Okay, from uh, from tomorrow's uh, on onwards, uh, I will give you more support to get together and work together. Okay, may I share the, may I share them with students? Okay. Yeah, I will. I will. I will share uh, the personal uh, uh, email addresses of uh, all students with you all. Okay. Okay. And for the for the week one, uh, I have sent an email announcing the. Uh, additional time for uh, the assignment one to each students uh, of whom uh, who cannot uh, who could not uh, submit uh, their uh, assignments okay shall we start Sh shall we continue with the assignment two 
Uh, first of all, each team will uh, choose one of the following two alternatives. Uh, there are two alternatives in the assignment too. Alternative one is very uh, clear. Neuroscientific technologies used in neuromarketing include functional magnetic resonance imaging, electroencephalography, steady state topography, and Zaltman metaphorical station technique. Uh, all I want is brief is to briefly is uh, you briefly research one of the above mentioned techniques and prepare a, a two thousand word paper on this technique, including which processes uh, it uses, how it operates, and which research was made using the one that you research for neuromarketing purposes. Okay, is that clear? Yes. And the alternative two. The task is during the whole week, from time to time, try to figure each of uh, each member of the uh, teams uh, will, from time to time, try to figure out or locate what they do or think of exactly during the whole week. Tomorrow. Thursday and Friday. Uh, for example, uh, try to figure out, locate what they do or think of exactly, what they think uh, when watching, seeing, eating, reading, following a particular media, playing a particular game, chatting, thinking, dreaming, etc. Just at the time you want anything or are in the mood for doing anything, whether strongly or not, and try to associate what you do with what you want or think. For example, you want a chocolate just when you watch a film or see a happy, see a happy couple. Every member of each team will try to locate such moments in which they want anything and do something simultaneously. Each member will try to collect four or five case, cases a day, maybe three. And on Friday, or uh, if you if it's if it's convenient on uh, Saturday, uh, as teams, this, you will discuss these moments or cases. Everybody, everybody in the team will share its cases uh, with uh, their other teammates. Uh, they will discuss the similarities and dissimilarities of their association. Given the similarities, uh, each uh, team will figure out what products or services to market to a specific audience. And with what type of marketing idea. And also each team will choose a product and services among these options, these cases, and accordingly, they will write a brief marketing idea which may best fit to the specific audience of the product or service they choose. Is that clear? A simple question to all. Is that clear? No. Okay. Yes. Do you create an idea? And these associations with what you do and what you see and what you want inside will, you, will, will give you insights to create a brief marketing idea. For example, if, you, if uh, four members of the team uh, uh, during the whole week uh, at some points of the day uh, four uh, teammates uh, within a team uh, want a chocolate when uh, just when they watch a film, a, a particular film. Film. Maybe uh, if they want a chocolate when they see a couple, a happy couple. So uh, you might you might have associated the chocolate with happiness. Okay. So, uh, 
uh, your marketing idea is to associate the happiness with chocolate. When you market a chocolate, you always attach the chocolate with happiness. Uh, you, uh, you write your routines of uh, some moments. You catch yourself uh, thinking of something when you do something. You try, you try to associate what you do or see or do whatever uh, with what you think, what you want. Maybe. Uh, the marketing idea sh should be something that the company haven't used so far or maybe have used so far. I don't care about the uh, similarity uh, of your uh, idea uh, with the actual ones. Okay, I, I will uh, check whether uh, you are uh, uh, constant uh, or in, in integri integrity, okay? Uh, Denika, what I'm trying to tell uh, when I take the uh, chocolate uh, example, when you associate the chocolate uh, with happiness, your marketing idea is to stress uh, very particularly and absolutely the happiness when you market a chocolate, okay? So you try to explain uh, why you are using the happiness uh, when you market a chocolate. Because you catch yourself, uh, you catch yourself in some moments you want deep in, inside a chocolate when you see a happy situation. Am I clear? Yes. And uh, if you feel comfortable, I, I, I prefer that you will discuss these situations in team discussion board so that I can see also these discussions. Yes, nobody was you will buy something that makes him sad. But chocolate uh, don't make anybody uh, sad. Just the contrary. Yes. Did you understand my concern? Yeah. What do you mean about the first choice from the task? Do we research only one of given four? Given four what? What for? Danica? Yes, each each team will prepare a uh, 300 words length paper uh, about the marketing idea. Minimum 300.
Yes, one of four topics in the alternative one. Just one. In any uh, version you want. I'm very uh, interested in the content, not the form. And what is more important uh, to me right now uh, is, the fa is, the, is the fact that you have to come together as teams and uh, start to work uh, together. No, not every member. Each team will submit one paper uh, for each of the alternatives. One paper. The paper uh, which will be submitted for the alternative uh, one will be at least 2,000 words. And the paper uh, for the alternative two, 300 words minimum and you must choose one of these uh, alternatives bravo to team four i hope that you will be a good example to all other teams Bravo also to team two. Then I will pick up the best teams with these with these assignments. Any other question from you? Please always remember that each team will do, will do only uh, one of the about two alternatives. The deadline to complete this assignment is March 12th. Is there, is there any question, any other question? Which match will be on TV, Champions League? Yeah. Watching watching a, a football match, uh, I wonder what you will uh, be thinking or be doing. And be wanting.
Real will beat Napoli. And for your other questions and for your all questions, you can write me to my eProfman email that is on the LMS also. And you can reach me by uh, other boards, discussion boards and uh, team boards also. Okay. Yes, will be. Yes, yes, it will be on the screen of, uh, of the webinars. Uh, yes, you are right, Denika. You should uh, think about it a lot. Why beer, not whiskey? Not marketing choice, a human choice. Yeah, but you you may be right. Yes, we understood that. If it's with key, you, you will remember the game uh, better. Okay. Thank you to all uh, for your attendance and for your interest. Try to catch yourself Try to catch yourself thinking of what you do and what you feel. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you again all. Thank you. Good night. And please get together. Please, I beg you. I'm begging you. Okay. I'm uh, very curious about what you will uh, be submitting uh, as assignments. Okay.